Hello, everyone. Can you, what's the sound like up the back there? Okay. So my name's Carl Graham. I'm the Director of Emergency Management for the Department of State Growth and one of behind the facilitation of this workshop today. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending this workshop today, which is a part of the Department's State Growth responsibility of sharing information on natural hazards um, usually related to geological threats um, in Tasmania. Shortly, I'll be introducing a, a panel of experts from Geoscience Australia who will be presenting um, information and sharing their expertise in regards to earthquake risks and mitigation measures. But before I start, I'd like to um, acknowledge the deep history and culture of this island and like to, and to acknowledge and pay respect to the Palawa people, the traditional owners of the land Lutawina, which we meet today and acknowledge their elders past and present. What will be happening today is around 10.30, we'll be having a break to grab some morning tea and we'll, at lunch will be at 12.30 and we encourage people to network and chat um, over lunch. We'll have um, opportunities to have um, discussions. But what I do in the meantime, if you've got your phone, if you don't mind putting it on um, silent and if you need to take a call, just head out into the foyer. So this project has been um, a collaboration between Geoscience Australia and the Department of State Growth, including Mineral Resources Tasmania, and was funded under the National Partnership Agreement for Disaster Risk Reduction. The aim of this project, which has been had some a slow gestation period due to interruptions caused by COVID, um, has been to improve the understanding on earthquake risks and hazards in Tasmania and using the local geological information and building makeup of the state to have a look at what would be the consequences of some credible earthquake scenarios and how we might be able to mitigate those risks. Now, I'd like to um, welcome our presenters for the day, Mark Edwards from Geoscience Australia, Trevor Allen, and Hock Ryuk, um, to our panel of experts who come to us um, sharing their knowledge on earthquake risk and consequence assessment, community vulnerability modelling, and building design mitigation measures. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the expertise provided um, over the last couple of years with this project in its design phase and implementation chain, um, phase. Um, from our Mineral Resources Tasmania geologists over there. So Claire Kane, Colin Mazengard and Nick Rogers, who have actually um, assisted in the advancing of this project. But that's me now. I will now hand over to Mark to start the day. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Carl. And, uh... Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here today and uh, presenting to you on this project that uh, be of great interest to us and which we think will be of great value uh, to the Tasmanian government. Now, the name of the project is Earthquake Risk and Mitigation Assessment in Tasmania. And we love acronyms, so nice acronym, ERMAT, uh, for, for the project. And uh, as the title uh, suggests, we're looking at earthquakes, we're looking at the risk posed by them and also looking at the opportunity uh, to change that risk uh, through mitigation measures. So before we go into the components of what we're presenting, I just thought I'd quickly go through the scope of this project. So basically we've been looking at all of Tasmania, so all of uh, Tasmanian communities, and we've also been considering the earthquake uh, risk to buildings, buildings used for residential purposes, uh, for commercial purposes, industrial and institutional. Uh, in this project, we've been assessing the surface earthquake hazard across the, the state. So we've been taking into account the uh, role of overlying soils to filter and, and amplify ground motion. Uh, it's involved improving our understanding of just what your assets are across the state. 
uh, particularly in Hobart. So we've been wanting to improve our understanding of your emergency services, hospitals and schools. As mentioned by Carl, it's involved modeling some scenario events. So three scenario events. We've assessed the, the risk across the state. Um, and for the 20 largest communities in Tasmania, we've developed some mapping products that we think will be of use to you. And then what we've done is we've taken the, the risk associated with damage and put it in the context of the resilience of the community to nuance that uh, understanding of risk to see where perhaps priorities might be uh, for, for communities at, the, uh, at a, a lot more local scale. And then finally, um, using uh, information developed in other work in Western Australia, we've undertaken a virtual retrofit of high-risk buildings here in this CBD in Hobart uh, to see how that risk changes uh, by a progressive address of high-risk buildings. So as we go through our presentation today, we're going to start off by talking about the hazard, the, the nature of seismicity in Tasmania, what that means in terms of probabilistic hazard. We'll look at how we've developed our understanding of what's in the way of earthquakes, the exposure, how vulnerable they are, then the impacts, the risk, combining it with resilience and mitigation. So the first thing we wanna talk about is earthquakes in Tasmania. So I'll hand over to Trevor. Okay, thanks very much, Carl and Mark, for that introduction. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna go right back to the start and start off with some, some real basics in terms of what is an earthquake? Um, so effectively an earthquake is sudden release of energy and subsequent ground shaking um, when rocks break along a fault line. And that's because of the stresses that are within the Earth's crust, um, which are usually from plate tectonic forces. And so that image that you see there on, on the, uh, the right there is actually a photograph that was taken following the magnitude 6.5 earthquake near Meckering in Western Australia. Um, and you can just see the, the consequences of that very large earthquake on the, the railway lines there, which was the main train line between Perth and Kalgoorlie at the time. Um, and it's really just to demonstrate that in Australia, yes, we do, we do have large earthquakes. Okay, so why does Australia have earthquakes? Um, so the Australian continent itself is sitting within the Australian tectonic plate, and we're moving roughly at a rate of around about seven centimetres a year um, in a northeasterly direction. Um, and as we're moving, we're colliding with other tectonic plates. And what that does is that it imparts stresses within the Australian tectonic plate. So you can kind of imagine um, the tectonic plate might be similar to a pavlova, for example. So it's the analogy that I like to use. So we've got our, our strong brittle crust on top um, and then a, a gooey uh, magma, or I mean, sorry, gooey um, meringue um, um, uh, uh, mantle. And so if we were to um, press on that pavlova, um, it'd start to crumble at the edges where we're, we're um, putting all of our, our force or exerting that force. And so that's kind of analogous to the, the plate boundary earthquakes that um, occur quite frequently in nature. And they're the, the largest earthquakes that do occur in nature. But if we continue to press on that pavlova, um, then we'll start to see cracks emerging within the middle of that tectonic plate or the middle of that pavlova. And so they're more uh, like the earthquakes that we see in Australia. So whilst we don't have the, the frequency of earthquakes that we see in the plate boundary regions like New Zealand, Indonesia, California, for example, um, we do have them, at, but they just take a lot longer to manifest. And if you'd like to hear more about pavlovas and earthquakes um, for a bit of gratuitous self-promotion, um, you can um, look at the Occam's Razor podcast that I, I um, recorded about a year or so ago. Okay, um, so we also have different types of faults as well. Um, so we have what's known as a normal fault. And so that's where we have tensional forces that are, are pulling the earth apart. Um, and that's quite common in places like the Great Rift, Great Rift Valley in Eastern Africa, uh, the North Island of New Zealand, and the Basin and Range Province in Utah and Nevada. What's more common in Australia, however, is because our crust is being squeezed, is that we have what's known as reverse or thrust faulting. So that's where uh, one block of the earth moves up over the other block. Um, and so that's quite common in, in most continental regions, um, particularly Australia. And then we also have 
what's known as strike slip or transfer vaulting. And that's where we have shear forces that um, force the, the either side of the rocks on, on the fault um, to, to slide past each other. And that's similar to what we see in uh, San, the San Andreas Fault in California, for example, or the Alp Alpine Fault in the Southern Island of New Zealand. Um, or we can get a bit of a mixture of both where we have um, an oblique earthquake rupture that could be both uh, um, a reverse and a strike slip. Okay, in terms of what we record um, uh, from earthquake ground shaking, um, the earthquakes generate um, different types of seismic waves and they travel at different speeds through the Earth's crust. So the first waves to arrive are usually the smallest um, and they're typically, and commonly we don't feel them as humans, but because they're at higher frequencies, um, you, you some of some of our pets like dogs or, or cats, smaller animals, um, will be more attuned to those higher frequencies. So they might actually start to feel the, the earthquake break, ground shaking before we do as humans. Um, so these are the, the primary earthquake waves. Um, and then we have the, the secondary earthquake waves or the shear waves. And these are the ones that actually cause the damage to, to the buildings and, and infrastructure. Um, and knowing the, the time difference um, between those P and S waves and how fast these waves travel through the earth, we can get a rough approximation of the distance from where you are, where, where the earthquake recording um, is taken uh, to the earthquake itself. And that this helps us with the, the location of the earthquake, which I'll get into in the next slide. Um, we have different types of seismic waves as well. So we've got, in addition to the P and the S phases, um, we also have what are known as very large surface waves. And these are quite common, particularly in Western Australia, where we have very shallow earthquakes. Um, and these can be some of the, the largest waves that we actually record, but they're usually quite, quite commonly at, at longer periods. Um, and so they don't often have a, a large impact on residential structures, for example. Okay, so how do we monitor or how do we measure earthquakes? So um, earthquakes are measured by sensitive um, instruments known as seismometers. And there's a, an image of uh, what a, a modern seismometer looks like. So effectively within that little container there, um, it's around about the same size as a, an ice cream container, like one of the, the fancy ice cream containers that you might buy at the supermarket. And really all it is is um, three very sensitive masses that are on springs and they're um, vibrating up and down within a, a, an electromagnetic coil that generates a voltage which we can then con convert into um, uh, a measure of the, the earthquake acceleration or velocity. Um, so the seismometers measure both the intensity and the duration of the ground shaking as we saw in the, the previous slide and the arrival times of these seismic waves and the speed at which they travel can be used to get an earthquake location. And, and just in that graphic there in the bottom, um, we see the, the red dot, which is where the epicenter of, that earth, of the earthquake is. Um, and it's surrounded by those three stations. And because we know at the rough speeds at which the, the seismic waves travel through the earth, um, we can triangulate that, um, that earthquake epicenter and, and get an, a location. Um, this is hampered a little bit in the fact that, particularly in Tasmania, in that we have uh, relatively sparse recording uh, stations within the state. Uh, and so there's essentially no seismic monitoring stations in Western Tasmania, which uh, can be a bit of a problem when we try and accurately locate earthquakes in that area. Um, and, and it's also, we see that uh, the, the, the seismic stations are almost in a, a T-shape. Um, meaning that we, we don't get good um, coverage or azimuthal coverage around the earthquake. So there can be quite a lot of uncertainty when we're trying to measure earthquakes in, in Tasmania in particular. Okay, so I'll now get into the concepts of earthquake magnitude <clears throat> and intensity. So magnitude um, is a, a measure of the earthquake size and um, as mag magnitude increases, the strength of the, the ground shaking, the duration of the ground shaking, and the area impacted from the earthquake increases very rapidly. So for every one magnitude increase, unit of increase, um, we see the 
uh, shaking intensity increased by a factor of 10. And the energy released increases by a factor of around about 32. So for example, if you, you go from a magnitude two to a magnitude four, you see roughly 100 times the amplitude of the ground shaking and roughly 1000 times um, the, the energy release. Um, the shaking duration can vary from a few seconds for say a magnitude four, right up to a few minutes for a, a magnitude nine earthquake, um, which are thankfully very rare and we will never see one in Australia. Um, these are <laughs> very large earthquakes that only occur at plate boundaries. Okay, um, so a lot of people often confuse magnitude with intensity. Um, so, an earthquake's magnitude is related to the energy that's released at the earthquake's epicenter, so where the earthquake actually occurs. Um, whereas the intensity of the earthquake refers to the level of the ground shaking that is observed at a given location at some distance away from the earthquake. Uh, the earthquake intensity decreases with increasing distance. Uh, and commonly we use what's known as the modified Macaulay intensity scale um, to describe the effects of an earthquake at a given place. So this is a, a qualitative um, measure of an earthquake strength um, based on the effects on people and structures. And uh, you can see here that we have a, a rating from one to, to 10 um, that describes the earthquake ground shaking from either not felt um, through to violent and extreme at the, at the upper ends. Um, and just to reinforce that point that earthquake magnitude is a, a quantitative measure based on the physical recordings um, that we make at, of using seismometers. Okay, so a little bit about Geoscience Australia and our capabilities. Um, so we operate the National Earthquake Alert Centre or the NEAC as we call it. And this is a 24 seven near real time earthquake monitoring and detection and analysis and alerting service. Um, we partner with the Bureau of Meteorology um, in forming the, the Joint Australian Tsunami Warning Centre. Um, and so the, the Tsunami Warning Centre is part of the Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning Mitigation System, um, which is operated in collaboration with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, in terms of local earthquakes, we provide those real-time alerts to um, the National Emergency Manage Management um, Agency uh, and a number of different um, state and territory emergency services as well. Um, and we provide those notifications for earthquakes of magnitude three and a half and greater within the Australian region. Um, so the images that we see there is just our 24-7 our system. Um, the one at the, the bottom on the left um, shows all of the stations that we actually bring into um, our operation center. So there's roughly about 500 or so stations that we're streaming in real time. Um, the international stations are mostly used for, to help us with the tsunami warning side of things. Um, whereas we operate around about 100 um, independent stations within Australia uh, to, to monitor for local earthquakes. And um, the, this bottom image there is on the right is just showing a, a typical uh, page for, for an earthquake. And this is the, uh, the Woods Point earthquake, which occurred um, almost a year ago today, um, the magnitude 5.9 earthquake that was felt um, extensively within Victoria and New South Wales and also into Tasmania as well, in, particularly in Northern Tasmania. And, and there was even some felt reports here in Tasmania, um, which is actually this next slide here. So one of the, the products that we, we developed um, is what's known as a, a felt grid, um, which also feeds into real time shaking intensity estimates. Um, but following this earthquake that was last year, uh, we received roughly 43,000 felt reports from the public, uh, which based on the, the questionnaire that people felt, uh, filled in, um, we could assign a, a shaking intensity to, to their responses. And so um, this is a really powerful tool to tell us where people are and what they felt. And we get this information almost immediately. So you can see on this chart there on, on the right um, that shows the, the number of felt reports that we've received. Unfortunately, our web page actually dropped out here um, due to <laughs> the amount of traffic that we were receiving. Um, but 
at its height, we were receiving about 7,000 reports um, every 10 minutes um, from following this earthquake from citizens that, that actually felt it. And so that information was fed directly back to um, the emergency services uh, in, in Victoria in their response to the earthquake. Okay, so on to uh, Tasmanian seismicity specifically. Um, so relative to the rest of the country, Tas Tassie is uh, characterized by relatively low um, rates of seismicity relative to other parts of, the, of Australia, such as the, the Eastern Highlands of, of Australia, the Flinders Ranges, and also the, the Southwest Seismic Zone in Western Australia. Um, the, the map here shows the historical earthquakes that are known to have occurred within Tasmania around about magnitude two and above. Um, there may be smaller earthquakes that uh, are occurring, but unfortunately our networks aren't uh, able to actually detect um, and, and locate them. Um, I'll talk about this cluster of earthquakes here on the next slide, but what, what you might see is that most of the earthquakes are occurring in, in Western Tassie. Um, unfortunately, that's where we have the fewest number of instruments to record them. Um, and you might also notice that uh, they're color coded by time um, and most of the earthquakes are, are colored in the, the yellow to orangey colors. That really just represents the fact that we're, that's now the instrumental period um, that we're looking at. So where we actually had instruments to record the, the, the the earthquakes that are occurring. It's, it's not indicating that the, the rate of earthquakes has actually increased um, in, in the, the later time period since the 1970s. Okay, so I mentioned um, those that cluster of bluey purple events um, in the Tasman Sea area. So what that was, was a, a really big earthquake swarm that occurred in 1883 to uh, 1892. And um, there are around about 2,000 events that were reported to be felt in uh, northeastern Tasmania at the time. Uh, the largest earthquake in the sequence was estimated to have been around about magnitude 6.9. So if that is accurate, that would actually have been the largest earthquake that would have occurred in Australian territory um, in the historical record. Um, so, and three of those earthquakes were estimated to have earthquakes greater than magnitude six. Um, so we can see what's on the map here showing the, the isoseismal um, map of the shaking intensity. And again, we're, we're seeing these, uh, these intensities of roughly six to seven um, in northeastern Tasmania. Um, and uh, yeah, this is generally felt um, all the way through the state. Um, and, and also into Victoria as well. Now, this earthquake actually caused damage uh, in Launceston, um, and, but that damage was likely exacerbated by the soft alluvial sediments on which mu much of the, the city actually is constructed on. Um, okay, so um, here's just a table showing other large earthquakes that have occurred in the Tasmanian region. Um, one thing to note here is that there really hasn't been any significant earthquakes recorded since, um, well, there's one in 2002, but before that, um, since, but before, well, since 1975. Um, so that could be due to a number of things. It could be due to the, the way we're actually calculating magnitudes now, um, or it could be that there, there were actually more larger earthquakes that were occurring within the state. Um, at earlier time periods. It's just one of those things that, that we, we just don't know. Another way we can look at earthquakes is that we can actually look at the, the landscape around us. Um, and the, the geology um, in the, the landscape actually span, uh, is able to tell us where earthquakes may have occurred or have occurred um, in the prehistorical era, so where, where we don't actually have written records of uh, earthquake occurrence. So our um, historical record of earthquake only really spans about two centuries. Um, and if we use Aboriginal oral traditions, perhaps we can take that back a little bit further. But the geology is, is really powerful in being able to tell us where, where large earthquakes um, have occurred, because it, it can preserve that record of those very large earthquakes. <clears throat> 
Um, so what we can do is we can undertake these um, paleo seismic studies and we, uh, after we can identify these, these features in, in topographic lineaments that are shown in that central image there, um, we can dig these very large trenches across them and identify where, where, um, where that displacement in that strata has occurred. Uh, and by, based on, um, on the amount of deformation or the amount of displacement um, and the, the timing of those earthquakes, we can get a, a rough approximation of well, like how big the earthquakes are, were and uh, how frequently they occur. Okay, so here's a specific um, Tasmanian example, and that's the, the Lake Ed Edgar Fault Scarp. Um, so uh, most of you probably know where that is. Uh, so there is a, a roughly 30 kilometer long fault scarp that's been mapped in the topography, which runs through Lake Pedder. Um, and uh, so the, the photo there um, shows what this looks like on the ground and um, you very clearly see that, that linear feature in, in the landscape. Um, so the studies that were undertaken about a decade or so ago indicate that there were at least three earthquakes that could be that were preserved in that um, in the trench that was excavated, and those earthquakes occurred around about eighteen thousand years ago, twenty eight thousand years ago, and somewhere between forty eight and sixty one thousand years ago. So in terms of an Australian fault. That is actually a, a relatively uh, large number of, of earthquakes occurring in a, a short amount of time, um, particularly when you consider that the magnitudes of those earthquakes probably were somewhere in the order of magnitude 6.8 to 7. Um, so they, again, um, should they reoccur, they would be the largest earthquakes that have been observed in Australia. Um, and so the, the chart there on the, the bottom there um, shows the amount of vertical displacement for each event. And you can see that it, it slowly builds, builds over time. Now, the one thing to make us suspect that this is not an ongoing sequence of earthquakes is that if that rate of earthquakes would, uh, were to con continue to occur, we would expect to see a big mountain range there, but we don't. Um, so apart from that little blip in the landscape, um, it's, it's a relatively flat uh, surface. Now, we can theorize about how those earthquakes are occurring. So um, what we think is probably happening is that we have this very rapid sequence of events, and then we have a long period of quiescence where pretty much nothing happens. It can happen for perhaps up to a million years or so. The challenge that we face when we're trying to estimate the, the earthquake hazard and consequent risk is, well, where are we in this, this step function here? So are we right at the top here? Have we finished all of the large earthquakes that we're going to see? Or are we somewhere down the bottom still? And in which case, we might expect to see large earthquakes in the not too distant geological future. <laughs> um, so I don't know whether there's any representatives from Hydro Tasmania here today, uh, but the work that was done a decade or so ago um, is now actually triggering some of the, the, um, the Edgar Dam strengthening projects because the dam is very, very close to that fault scar. Okay. All right, so I'll give you a, a bit of an overview of how we actually calculate seismic hazard. So this is done um, using a, a methodology that we call probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. Um, and so I'll give you a, a bit of a lesson in, in the dark arts. But the, the key um, pieces that go into seismic hazard analysis are our earthquake sources. So that is, where do the earthquakes occur? How big are they? And the ground motion. Um, so when an earthquake occurs, what is the likely shaking intensity that we might experience from one of these large events? And then we can use that information to, to generate what's known as a hazard curve. Um, now, I developed these slides when I was living in Canada, so, uh, and it took me a very long time to construct this slide, so I haven't <laughs> redone them for Australia. Um, but we can imagine that we've, we've got a site where that, that star is, that we're interested in calculating the hazard for. Um, we might have a fault that's mapped uh, here, and that fault, through geological investigations, we might think is have, uh, might have a, a slip rate of around about 50 millimetres a year. So 
Um, just to put that in context, that's probably about three orders of magnitude larger than anything we, we'd see in Australia, but it is possible in, in North America. Um, the next thing we wanna do is try and work out how frequently those earthquakes occur. Um, so we can develop what's known as uh, magnitude frequency uh, distributions that show us the rate at which different magnitude earthquakes occur. And we can model these in different ways. So one is a, um, what's known as a, a Gutenberg-Richter magnitude relationship where that essentially says that there's gonna be more smaller earthquakes relative to the larger earthquakes, or we can use what's known as a, a characteristic magnitude relationship um, that tells us that, well, when this fault goes, it'll just go in a, a characteristic sized earthquake um, that could be around about, in this case, around about magnitude 7.5. So what that means is that most, for the characteristic earthquake magnitude case, um, is that most of the slip, that 50 millimeters of year slip, is taken up in those very large earthquakes, whereas the, the Gutenberg-Richter relationship um, distributes that slip across more evenly across the distant different sized earthquakes. Okay, so then we might, in this green area here, um, we might have an area that we know earthquakes occur, um, but there's no mapped faults that we can attribute those, those earthquakes to. So we draw a simple box around them, and again, we can develop our, our magnitude frequency relationships. Um, we might hedge our bets a little bit and think perhaps, well, there might be fewer earthquakes, there might be more earthquakes. And so we can weight them in our, our hazard assessment as to how confident we are as to um, what the actual rates of those earthquakes are. And importantly, so we, we get the, the earthquake information largely from our historical earthquake catalogs, um, whereas the information on the, the faults can come from our paleo seismology or GPS um, analysis. Okay, so the next part is ground motion models. So this is one of the parts that's, that's probably drives a, most of the uncertainty um, in our modeling. And that's knowing that when an earthquake occurs, what is the shaking intensity going to be? Um, so what these ground motion models do is they estimate the expected or median ground shaking in intensity um, in terms of a, a peak ground acceleration, a peak ground velocity, and response spectral acceleration. And typically what we see is um, with distance increasing is that that intensity of the shape shaking peak ground acceleration in this case decreases with distance. Um, and so that shaking intensity depends on the magnitude of the earthquake, um, the source to site distance, the site condition, so the geology that the, the site is sitting on, um, the mechanism, mechanism of the earthquake and the way, uh, way the earthquake actually ruptures as well. And so this is just an example um, from, uh, in, in this case, it's the 2012 earthquake that occurred near Maui in Victoria, um, showing the, the crosses indicate the data and the, the lines there indicate the, the scatter or the variability in the different models um, that are trying to predict the, the the, those shaking intensities. Now, as engineers, I assume there's a few of you that are engineers in here, um, it's more important to try and determine, well, how does that ground shaking affect the buildings? And so what we do is we essentially say that a, a building is equivalent to a single degree of freedom. So that's effectively um, an, a, a little oscillator with a, a mass on the top. Um, and so we can calculate the maximum response of those um, SDOF oscillators um, that have a, a range of resonant periods. And so here we've got images of, of three different buildings to three different size buildings. Um, the smaller low rise buildings will tend to have a, a, a smaller natural period, medium rise, you might see uh, natural periods for roughly 5.5 seconds. And then when you get to your larger buildings, you might start to see uh, larger natural periods. And so what we have is an input um, ground motion that goes into the base of that building that uh, moves the, the, the oscillator. And what we get out of it is the, the response of that oscillator. And so we can do that for the different periods of shaking and we can come up with what's known as a, a response spectrum. Okay, so that's the ground motion side of things. 
Um, once we all combine that information, um, so our earthquake sources, the occurrence of those sources and the ground motion, we can calculate the, the seismic hazard. So that's typically ascribed as the 10% the or 2% probability of exceedance in 50 years. Um, a lot of people like to re refer to that as the return period, in which case it's the, the 475 or 2,475 year return period. Um, what we're seeing here is the, the 2018 National Seismic Hazard Assessment, um, which is calculated for peak ground acceleration on a particular site class. Um, and you can generally see that, yeah, those places in the Eastern Highlands, in particular the Metro Valley um, and East, uh, Southwest Seismic Zone and the Adelaide region are probably the, the higher hazard areas um, in Australia and, and Tasmania, by contrast, is relatively low in terms of the, the long-term um, seismic hazard forecast. Okay, um, we also know that the geological conditions on which uh, our site sit can significantly vary um, the, the amplitude of the ground shaking that we, we observe. Um, and so that cartoon in the, the middle there uh, essentially shows that phenomena. So seismic waves, they, they travel through um, firm crystalline bedrock and they then might encounter some softer sediments. Um, and those softer sediments have lower seismic velocity. So when, when the energy is passing through that crystalline basement into those low velocity sediments, what happens is there's actually a conservation of energy. And so while the, the wave slows down, the amplitude of that wave actually increases. Um, and that can significantly affect the, the built environment on which uh, is, is, is constructed on those sediments. Um, so we have a, a national scale um, site conditions map that we're, I've just pulled out the, the um, Tasmanian part of that. Uh, you can't really see too much at this scale. Um, but what we can also do is uh, what's known as microzonation studies. And that's, that's looking at um, the ambient seismic wave field uh, at, a, at a particular site. And we can try and get a, a bit of a handle on what the, the seismic velocity conditions are um, with an, at a particular area, and then what the potential for ground shaking amplification is. And so those images down the bottom there are just a, an example of some studies that were undertaken in Hobart that we reinterpreted through, through this study. Um, and so that's, that's helped us um, better constrain the, the, the um, site conditions map here for both Hobart and, and Launceston. Um, so, on the, the left there, we see that the site conditions map for, um, for Hobart, and we had some contributions from the, the MRT team here in Tassie um, that, that helped us change some of the, the assignments of the, the site conditions map. Um, but in generally, the, the red to orange colors, you would expect to see um, higher amplification of the ground shape. Um, and so I guess here's the airport is somewhere around here. I think I recognized it on, on the, the way in. So it's, it's sitting on a site that it, uh, certainly has the potential for, for amplification of ground motion. Um, for one system in particular, um, you can see here there's a, a lot of red and orange where, where the main um, CBD is built. And so that's obviously a, a bit of a concern in terms of the earthquake risk. Um, Okay, so I think this is my very last slide for this section. So hopefully I haven't gone too far over time. Um, but what we can do then with the, both the, the National Seismic Hazard Assessment and our, um, our National Site Conditions Map is that we can actually generate um, a, a probabilistic seismic hazard assessment uh, and, and compare what we get on just a, a systematic rock site versus what we um, would get on a, a soil site. And so um, the, the maps at the top, um, whilst you do, probably don't see a, a lot of difference between them, um, there, are, there are some minor differences there that show um, generally higher ground shaking potential um, for, for sites on those um, softer site conditions. And then, so that's just the, the blow up of the, the Hobart region there. Um, and you can certainly see that some areas close to the Derwent River um, have a, a higher potential for earthquake ground shaking or higher earthquake hazard. Okay, so I'll hand it over to Mark now and he'll start talking about exposure. 
Well, thank you, Trevor. So now what we want to do is uh, look at how we have defined uh, the building assets of value uh, across Tasmania. Um, and just recalling the, the scope that we have, we're looking at all of Tasmania. Uh, we're looking in a little bit more detail in the 20 largest communities. And uh, in the case of Hobart, um, we're even looking at how we might augment the exposure information for the study region. So greater Hobart region is quite, quite a bit bigger than what we see there. Um, but if you look at the area in gray on the bottom left or bottom right, sorry, um, that's where we set about trying to improve um, the exposure information. So how have we done that? Well, um, basically with exposure, what we need is we need enough information about the building so that we can wrap, uh, map a vulnerability model to it to assess uh, the damage to the building. And we also need to be able to as assign a value uh, to the building. So we know the economic loss that's associated with, with building damage due to an earthquake. And across the, the four primary uh, usages of the buildings, residential, commercial, industrial, and institution. So for Hobart, we've actually drawn upon three sources. We've used our national exposure information system. I'll tell you a little bit about that in the next slide. Uh, we've also made use of an engineering survey of Hobart that's been done uh, for the purposes of counterterrorism, actually, um, under a program that we contributed to at Geoscience Australia, uh, but we captured the information so we can use it for natural hazards as well. So we've made use of that. And then finally, uh, with assistance from state growth in identifying uh, facilities of interest, we've uh, also done a desktop survey of 702 buildings uh, used for emergency management at hospitals and schools. And then for the rest of the state, it's basically been Nexus as our definition. So what is Nexus? Well, it's the National Exposure Information System. Uh, it's been developed by Geoscience Australia over a period of over 10 years. What we do is we take uh, information that's available within the state um, and then we augment it uh, using a statistical model so that we end up with a representative exposure for Tasmania. In fact, it's a representative exposure uh, for Australia. Um, so we've been very fortunate in Tasmania in that your value of generals uh, has perhaps the best uh, residential building information that they maintain. So that is incorporated into Nexus and other sources of information, land use planning, uh, the national geocoded national address file and so on. And so we've got this uh, consistent picture of buildings of value um, across Tasmania. And incidentally, you can access uh, Nexus through what's called the Australian Exposure Information Platform. Uh, the web address is there, where for a number of things, not just buildings, but a range of uh, demographic and, and social information as well, uh, you can define a, a ge geography of interest and it will extract you for you the, what's in that geography uh, in a, in a formalized report. So uh, that's a resource that you could make use of if you wanted to. But for uh, Hobart, we've made use of the engineering survey of the CBD. In fact, we did it about four years ago. We're planning to update it for new development presently. Uh, so about 500 buildings that you can see there in the top right. It's actually a three-dimensional model because we use it to uh, model blast waves and plume dispersion. Um, but we've also, in capturing about 100 data fields for each building. Uh, we also capture information that enables us to map earthquake vulnerability and wind vulnerability uh, to buildings. Now, what this enabled us to do is to give us a fairly good understanding of buildings that might be of higher risk to earthquake in Hobart. And here are some examples of it. And uh, later we'll talk about the models that we've been able to uh, map to these buildings. So that brings us to the vulnerability um, aspects of this project. So what is a vulnerability model? Well, here's a quick course on them. Uh, it's basically the relationship between exposure to uh, ground shaking and the overall damage outcome. So in terms of loss, if we're looking at this plot here, we're looking at, at severity of ground shaking, modified Macaulay intensity, and Trevor told us a little bit about that in his presentation. On the y-axis, uh, we've got the severity of damage represented by the damage index. So that's the cost of repairing the earthquake damage divided by the cost of completely rebuilding on the site from starting again. So beyond a certain threshold, we can think of the, the damage increasing. Um, so if say the modified Macaulay intensity is seven, so 
quite uh, common ground shaking in Newcastle following the Newcastle earthquake, um, just go back, we then end up with an overall damage index, which is about, around, about 0.13 in terms of severity of damage. So that's the average loss for a population of buildings of the type that this curve represents. Now, another way we can describe vulnerability is called a fragility curve, where we uh, plot the likelihood that a building of the certain type of interest uh, will be damaged to a certain degree. So again, if we look at our modified McCallie intensity seven uh, from this, we can say that there's a, say a 29% chance that our building is undamaged uh, in this level of ground shaking, a 32% chance that's uh, slightly damaged and down to about an 8% chance that it's completely damaged in, in economic terms. So we've used both of these uh, types of vulnerability functions, if you like, uh, in this project. Now we do know that buildings are damaged in earthquakes. And, and uh, here's an example, the Newcastle 1989 earthquake. You notice that unreinforced masonry buildings are damaged, uh, but also uh, more contemporary reinforced concrete frame buildings were also damaged in the Newcastle earthquake. However, what we do find is that by far the unreinforced masonry is the most vulnerable. So here's Meckering, 1968, another more recent example, Kalgoorlie, 2010. And uh, for example, in Kalgoorlie, it was only older unreinforced masonry uh, that had significant damage. Now, what goes wrong with unreinforced masonry buildings? Well, a uh, lot of component damage. So starting from the left, parapets fall off, okay, which represents quite a, a risk to people. That's a view from Kalgoorlie. Uh, sometimes the parapet falls off with the top story wall with it because it's not tied in at the roof level. And that's, a, that's an example from Christchurch. Uh, we can have partial failure of gables and chimneys, or the gable can fall off and take part of the wall with it. Or if the shaking is more intense, we can find the actual building box of masonry walls can be uh, quite significantly damaged. And the reason why we have this problem is legacy. And that is that uh, for most of our settled history, we haven't considered earthquake in the design of our infrastructure. In fact, it wasn't really till the mid nineties following the Newcastle earthquake, we had our oops moment and we ended up with a nationally applied uh, design standard for earthquake loadings. And older unreinforced masonry buildings, they're particularly vulnerable. Uh, they're quite prevalent and isn't the Hobart CBD an excellent example of that. Um, and also they're valuable, they're heritage buildings. We have a lack of retrospectivity in our building regulation, unlike New Zealand. Um, and also uh, the risk is exacerbated because we're in an intraplate environment and Trevor described that because of the way uh, intraplate uh, crust is crushed like a pavlova, um, it can store a lot of energy before um, you get the release of, of it in an earthquake. And so the very rare events could be, can be quite large compared to the ones that we, we designed for. And so uh, that's a little different to plate boundaries such as uh, in New Zealand. And finally, earthquakes, come without warnings, not like a bushfire. It's not like a storm system or a flood where generally we can warn people, earthquakes happen and, uh, and people are exposed. So this is the concern we have, uh, which was illustrated in the uh, Christchurch earthquake. This is Manchester Street in Christchurch. You can see the masonry has come off those buildings, landed on the street, landed on a bus. Um, and within the Christchurch CBD, 39 people died because of falling masonry. And that's what we don't want to see in our Australian communities. So looking at the vulnerability models themselves for uh, non-masonry buildings, we've made use of uh, US models adapted those, both in terms of loss and fragility. And we've used those also in other cities in Australia. But when it comes to the masonry buildings, we've been able to draw upon some recent uh, research on the type of old URM buildings we have uh, in Australia. So it's two projects. The first one under the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, where uh, we uh, collaborated with the University of Adelaide uh, with a case study on the heritage town of York. That's their beautiful town hall there. Um, and then that was followed by a further study funded under the National Partnership Agreement in the state, uh, where we looked at implementing mitigation uh, in York. So as part of that project, we, we looked at the types of heritage buildings in the town. The initial project identified six types and you have similar types here in Tasmania. Maybe the, the two-story pubs slightly different architecturally, 
but for a large part, very similar buildings with similar vulnerabilities. And then in the succeeding project, we extended that to nine buildings where we looked at other types of common unreinforced masonry heritage buildings, uh, churches, the town hall, and also uh, the taller load-bearing unreinforced masonry buildings that we uh, see in our cities. So what goes, what fails in these buildings? Well, if we just look at these two examples, uh, we get the failure of components. So we can lose parapets, chimneys, uh, facade walls. In the case of churches, we can lose gables. The bell towers themselves are, are vulnerable as well as the nave walls. And then if we look deeper into the building structure, the actual masonry box of the building itself is, uh, is vulnerable uh, in the global response of the building to the earthquake. When it comes to damage states, these have been, were defined in this research. So if we're looking at the box of the building, we looked at slight damage through to full collapse, slight cracking th through to the most severe damage state where the whole building uh, actually failed. And uh, from that, we were able to then model the overall vulnerability of the building, starting with component level vulnerability. And this was work that Hyuk did, where we could translate um, the component level vulnerability and the vulnerability of the box into an overall vulnerability curve of the building. So how does the vulnerability compare? Well, all of these buildings were quite vulnerable, but not to the same extent. So altogether, nine different types of buildings. If we look at the severity of ground motion to result in a, a damage index of 0.5. In other words, the cost of repair is half the cost of rebuild. What we found was that the least vulnerable by a whisker uh, was your single story Victorian house. Uh, whereas uh, your two story with a high facade commercial building in the main street in the initial study was, uh, was more vulnerable. So a lower acceleration to result in a damage index of 0.5. Uh, but then when we moved on to these other types, we found that they were progressively more vulnerable still. And the most vulnerable we considered was the four-storey load-bearing unreinforced masonry building with big open uh, windows on the street for commercial purposes, which tended to weaken the building for shaking up and down the street. So these are the vulnerability models that we've applied both for non-masonry buildings and for unreinforced masonry buildings, because we have that detailed exposure information, we've been able to attribute them and in turn use them uh, to assess the consequences of scenario events here in Hobart and also uh, to assess the overall risk across the state. So let's now have a look at the scenario selection and I'll hand back to Trevor. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Um, and I will be very brief here. I've only got two slides to show. Um, so I guess, yeah, one of the important ways to demonstrate the, the impacts of earthquakes is to actually use scenarios um, that we think are plausible uh, and could pose a risk to communities. Now, one of the benefits of having our, our national seismic hazard assessment is that these hazard assessments are actually a, a treasure trove of scenarios. So what we're doing is we're, we're modeling thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of scenario events um, and looking at the probability of those earthquakes occurring. Um, one of the things that we can do then with those probabilistic hazard assessments is we can actually disaggregate those earthquakes that are causing the most ha hazard to a particular region. And so, uh, this disaggregation here is effectively showing uh, the, the magnitude of the earthquakes um, and the distance of those earthquakes to the particular site of interest. And in this case, this is the, the one for Launceston. And we see that in general, um, the, the earthquakes that contribute the most to the local hazard in Launceston are actually the, the relatively small earthquakes but at close distance. And this is actually pretty common for, for most sites across Australia. Um, so with that information, we were then able to develop um, a, an earthquake scenario selector tool. Um, and for anyone interested, I can give you a bit of a demo of this um, at, at the break. Um, but effectively what we've got is um, a, a suite of what we call shake maps for hypothetical earthquakes near population centres within Australia. Uh, and this just shows one of the ones near Hobart. Um, I think this was 
maybe a magnitude 5.1, I, I can't recall, um, but just showing the intensity contours, the shaking intensity contours um, that have been modified by the, the site conditions that we have in the area. Uh, and uh, so, so these are, are useful tools for local state um, governments um, and, and for emergency management and, and um, desktop planning. And so the, the web link to the scenario selector tool is there. Um, so the, the scenario events that we used in this study um, were a couple, one, one of the events um, that was identified from the, the disaggregation of the probabilistic seismic hazard. And so that was the, the magnitude 4.9 at a very close distance to the, the city of Hobart. Um, and just because it is a, a known earthquake source, we also modeled the, um, the Lake Edgar fault scar as well as a magnitude seven earthquake. Now, um, I probably should point out here that there is still a lot of uncertainty when we're forecasting what the ground shaking intensities are at, at large distances. Um, and so because we know that most of our hazard generally comes from earthquakes in the near field, when we select our ground motion models that go into the, the seismic hazard assessment, so how the, the shaking attenuates with distance or decays with distance, we really do focus on that near source component. Um, so there's, there is a lot of uncertainty on what the intensity of the ground shaking would be at those larger distances. So for example, if we're comparing the, the Lake George, uh, sorry, I'm not Lake George, uh, <laughs> Lake Edgar scarp uh, relative to the city of Hobart. So that's perhaps something to, to keep in mind when, when Kilk's going through the, uh, the loss examples. Um, so that's it from me. Now, did we want to break for some questions, Mark, or is that? Um, I think we might just go to you and then we'll go okay. to all right, great. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm just I mean, trying to quickly go through, I mean, the um, how we calculate actual loss, I mean, from the scenario events that um, just Mark uh, and the I mean, Trev I mean, presented. So basically we used, I mean, the uh, impact and risk assessment framework, I mean, shown, I mean, in this slide. So there are three key components that uh, we touched upon. The one is the ground motion uh, and the building information um, is, I mean, exposure, and then the vulnerability and fragility functions relating to the ground motion intensity to the I mean, building damage. So we used, I mean, the all three key um, components to uh, compute the building damage from the, I mean, the, those, I mean, the uh, events. Sets. And the um, actual calculation was done at the building level. So each individual building, we know the location and then given location, we know the intensity level. And then we know that the building value of the, um, the, the building. So with the actual calculation was done at the building level. And then later on, we aggregate um, by the statistical uh, area um, one and then up to a um, certain amount in the community level as well. So just, I mean, the um, Treb, I mean, yeah, presented, I mean, the, uh, the three scenarios that we've chosen. So basically uh, one is just, I mean, rupturing at Lake Edgar and then two others are nearby the Hobart. So when you see that the, um, the, the modified magnet, uh, modified the Macaulay intensity at the Hobart CBD area, it is, um, ranging, I mean, between four and five, which give us uh, some idea of, I mean, how severe or I mean, how moderate, I mean, the shaking it will be. So it is not as, I mean, severe as uh, the, uh, the Newcastle earthquake, but it is, I mean, the similar type of, I mean, the earthquake you can imagine. And the scenario was, I mean, developed, I mean, to provide, I mean, the useful information for, especially for emergency planning. Um, so with I mean, more tangible outcomes, uh, such as I mean, the building loss in aggregated I mean, way or the number of people injured I mean, from the event or some like a number of, I mean, um, number of I mean, the damaged buildings and then some of the um, information that can be used by the I mean, emergency um, um, agencies. And when you calculate the um, the building damage, 
and then and then displayed by the I mean SA one level, you can see that um, across the, I mean, the all the selected events, um, the the loss ratio is actually ranging between I mean 0 0.01 to 0 0.02, uh, which is like a um, one percent or I mean two percent of the whole um, value of um, replacement cost over the area, which is not that I mean like a great, and the 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 Lake Edgar um, event is actually causing some damage. I mean, far from the I mean the epicenter, like a burning Somerset. I mean, still I mean can have some sort of like a damage. And then other two events. I mean nearby Hobart. I mean the Hobart is the main area uh, sustained damage from those I mean events, but um, more or less I mean about the same um, the damage from those I mean events. And if you look at the I mean the number of damaged buildings, and you can see that um, the buildings um, sustaining more than extensive damage are very minimal. It's like less than ten buildings would be you know complete or I mean collapsed damage states. And then we also calculate the indoor like uh, uh, casualties from the um, from the I mean the number of I mean damaged buildings. And then there is no meaningful um, numbers of I mean, casualties or, uh, or calculated, estimated. But I mean, still, as, as I mean, Trev said that I mean, these scenarios are, um, uh, I mean, coming with I mean, a lot of uncertainties, uncertainties. So still it is a useful information, but we would not I mean, use this information to predict any future events. And then also, Mark, I mean, would I mean um, bring this issue, but there is a great danger of I mean some falling um, hazard onto pedestrians, um, since I mean there are many many I mean buildings with I mean the parapets and chimneys, which could I mean fall upon to uh, pedestrians on the street. So still there is I mean, great danger, and then um, um, we can I mean, we we would. would we was not able to I mean, predict any meaningful numbers of casualties, but I would say that there is some dangers from the, the shaking as well. That's pretty much wrapping the scenario impacts. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, Carl, would this be the juncture to break for morning tea? And then maybe we could start the session when we come back with any questions you might have to date. So you may have some questions on what you've heard so far, and then we'll move on into the risk assessment itself. Okay, yep. So thank you everyone for listening this morning. So as we have heard, you know, we've talked, we've heard about the um, seismic and earthquake risks here in Tasmania. We've seen the modeling here that sort of shows us that um, um, again, timing can affect uh, um, our consequences, but with most people, if they're inside at the time, um, there were negligible or indeterminate number of um, casualties. So it shows you that most of our damage is related to you know, the property and aesthetics of the scenario. So what I might do is now, from what we've spoken about so far, is let's, for the next 10 minutes or so, we'll take questions from the floor to our um, panel of experts here. So anyone got some questions they would like to ask? Colin. Um, you talked about the size of the on a free network before. Why does the driver, how can we find a driver or a, someone who pay to improve that network and is there any value in that? Uh, yep, that's a very good question, uh, <laughs> um, and I, I would certainly see significant value in augmenting the publicly available seismic network. Um, as I was just talking to a colleague from um, Hydro Tas Tasmania, the, they do have private seismic monitoring networks here and within the state, um, and I, I forgot to mention that. Um, but that data is not publicly available in the real time, um, which certainly is not uh, helpful for us in terms of 
better characterizing the earthquakes and, and the response in near real time, but we can often get that data from the, the data owners and, and use it for our research purposes. Um, in terms of installing new seismic instrumentation, I'm, I'm always an advocate for, for more seismic sensors. And we have spoken internally about having better monitoring in the, particularly the north northwest, um, which is where a lot of the, the seismic activity is actually occurring. Um, you might've seen in that table that I showed earlier that a, a lot of the seismicity, the largest events weren't necessarily within Tasmania, they were off the west coast or near King and Flinders Islands. Um, so having more monitoring in the north and, and west um, would certainly be, be useful. In terms of how to go about that, um, I mean, one of our seismic sensors is, uh, I mean, it's quite expensive for us to install and maintain. Um, I guess the maintenance is the main issue as well, having a, 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 a relatively small work, workforce. Um, so where we can partner with local state agencies to, to help with that, that would be good. But then there's also low cost um, seismic monitoring systems that we also use. So there's this product called a, what's a Raspberry Shake, um, which is essentially just a, um, a, a board with a, a single component seismometer, um, but it's hooked up to a global network. So you plug it into the net, plug it into the internet and um, it automatically streams data to um, that global network of um, seismic enthusiasts, I suppose. Um, but we can actually use that data to, to help us. Um, the, the data is not of research quality, but it's useful for identifying and locating earthquakes. So there's a couple of options there and I'd be yeah, certainly keen to have further conversations on um, augmenting our network in the state. Uh, so the main reason it wasn't considered is because we don't really have very good models <laughs> um, to, to characterize that amplification. But yeah, we, we do know that um, at the top of, of hill peaks and, and mountain peaks, uh, you can also get the focusing of, of seismic energy as well, and that can lead to an amplification. Um, typically, though, we tend to say, see that most populated centres, they, they tend to settle on the flat lying lands, um, which tend to be the, historically the most fertile <laughs> lands, which is why most of our, our settlements are on rivers and, um, and, and river valleys and, and so forth. So that's, that's why the focus on um, the, the basin amplification side of things. Um, but yeah, certainly that, that is a, um, a factor. I don't know whether the question is for you, Sarah. Uh, I understand that there are some studies about the effect of tsunami on coastal communities in Tasmania, and I don't know whether you talked about the convention that Yeah, so we won't be talking specifically about tsunami, um, but again, at Geoscience Australia, like the, the national scale probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, we do a, a national scale tsunami hazard assessment as well. Um, it looks like Carl wants to say something. I was, I was going to say, <laughs> um, at lunchtime, I encourage you to connect over there with Claire, who's sitting there smiling and grinning. <laughs> um, and she'll be able to help you about the modelling that's been done across uh, south, southeast and northeast Tasmania in regards to the sign up, the tsunami modelling. Mm. Yeah, but cert certainly there are potential sources of tsunami, like south of New Zealand, for example, that could impact uh, um, Eastern Tasmania. So yeah, I guess, yeah, Claire is the person to talk to. <laughs> Just a question relation to the modelling of the Hobart, particularly from the event scenario one, in relation to the dam, dam walls obviously in that area, the high dogs who have a risk profile for the event, is that considered to be of, um, an importance in terms of look at down river, especially south and Peter, in terms of going to Juice and Hindu, as part of that data mm. that they can contribute to these factors. Yeah, so I don't, I mean, it's not something that we've covered in this particular study, but certainly dam owners are very aware of the, the impacts of, of earthquakes. So they're, they're considered low probability, but very high consequence 
um, events. Um, Mark, I don't know whether you wanted to talk at all about the vulnerability of dams at all and the likelihood of failure. <laughs> it's probably in the same category as to topographic amplification. <laughs> Um, yeah, if, if you do have vulnerability models for dams that, that are representative for, for the dam, you, you could actually model the likelihood of a dam break. But for us, we we don't have those those models. But certainly if you do get a dam break, yes, you're going to get downstream flooding and all sorts of problems. And that, that's a risk that you need to get a handle on. Yeah. Mm. And I, I guess, I mean, there's the vulnerability side from the, the ground shaking potential itself, but there's also a ground motion displacement has it as well so if the fault actually ruptures through that piece of the infrastructure then that could have major consequences as well and as um we know that the the lake edgar dam is essentially abutted right up against that fault scar so <laughs> um, if that fault moves there, there could certainly be damage to the, that infrastructure yeah, and, and just from experience in New Zealand, we're going back a few years, but uh, earthquakes can also cause damage to earth dams as well and, and result in, in piping. Um, and so you can end up with a progressive failure taking place, which you'll, might need a dewatering of the dam. So Matahina Dam in the Bay of Plenty was an example of that, where the earthquake, the Edgecombe earthquake, did damage the, the dam to the extent that it had to be rebuilt uh, as a result. So I don't know whether you've got many earth dams, but earth dams have certain vulnerabilities as well. So um, in fact, we're just having a, a conversation just before the tea break about that. Um, we've just finished a study of the Perth metropolitan area and the critical infrastructure that supports it. Perth has a higher hazard than, than say Hobart and Launceston. Um, and what we would expect with the, these sort of events, um, everything else being equal, is that you wouldn't have very much bridge damage. Um, also, when it comes to uh, electrical uh, distribution facilities such as your zone substations and so on. But perhaps where you might have a, an issue is if you've got a very vulnerable thing in there that you've inherited. And, and what we have noticed is that sometimes the very important control building is unreinforced masonry, you see. So that's particularly vulnerable. So it, it, you could actually have a yard which is operational, but you actually don't have the safety relays because they've been, been damaged through some damage to, to, to the building. So what we have found with critical infrastructure, sometimes it's finding where the Achilles heel is, where, where, where that little vulnerability is, and, and then set about strategically addressing it. In terms of liquefaction, th these sort of earthquakes wouldn't cause, putting aside being more locally <laughs> close to the, the Lake Edgar rupture, which is a very big event, but the local earthquakes um, wouldn't really um, have the intensity and duration of shaking to cause widespread liquefaction. And that can be a problem uh, for buried services. But again, you may have a particularly vulnerable part of your, your network um, and, and it might be enough uh, uh, to cause, cause a failure. But I, just as it's a generally, generally a, a reasonable good, reasonably good news story for buildings, and it's the most vulnerable with the greatest risk to people that you might wanna focus on, for critical infrastructure, generally, it'll probably be a, a reasonably good news story, but there may be some little weaknesses that the earthquake will expose. Mm. In scenario one, uh, the reactivation of the fault, you just comment on aftershocks and potentially what would be experienced in high time. Yep, uh, so another good question. So for an, a surface rupturing earthquake like that, we would certainly expect to see um, a large number of aftershocks. Um, if it is uh, in the order of a magnitude seven main shock, then it's, I guess, the general rule of thumb that we use is that the aftershocks are potentially one magnitude unit smaller than the main shock, so the, the, the largest aftershock. So that's, again, still a very large earthquake in magnitude six-ish event, um, which would certainly be felt um, most across 
well, all of the state and perhaps even into, into southern uh, mainland as well. Um, and in addition to that, yeah, there would probably be thousands of, of smaller events. Um, so to put that into perspective, um, a, a small surface rupturing earthquake in southwest WA in, in 2018 um, was a magnitude 5.3. It left a, a seven kilometre long surface rupture. Uh, and we recorded about 700 aftershocks of varying magnitudes um, from, from that relatively small event. Um, so we could probably expect to see, yeah, or, order of magnitude. Oh, and the 2016 Peterman Ranges earthquake, um, I think we recorded 5,000 aftershocks from that one. So, yeah. And if I could just add to the issue of aftershocks, let's say you've had an earthquake and you have here in Hobart had masonry fall from buildings, right? You might have something that's teetering up there and the aftershock will bring it down. So from, you know, emergency services going in there, maybe rescuing people, urban search and rescue if they're buried, you have to be very aware of uh, something that might come down, you know, in an aftershock. Mm -hmm. I guess also on that, the frequency of vibration of different magnitude earthquakes can also affect buildings differently as well. So larger events will, will tend to have uh, relatively more long period energy. Um, and so potentially might have the potential to, to damage larger structures than the smaller earthquakes. And perhaps that's one of the limitations of the vulnerability models that we may have used here because we're using a, a short period vulnerability model um, in modeling some of these these damages to places like Hobart when in reality it, that spectrum of the shaking might push to a, a longer period of shaking and could cause more damage potentially. Could I just ask before we wrap up just to sort of within your slight and moderate ones what would be the, um, the type of damage you, that we're looking at in that in that slight category? Yeah, well, certainly with, with slight, the, the, those buildings will tend to be the, the masonry ones, predominantly. You, you're going to see uh, cracking in, in those, those buildings. Um, and then probably when you're getting more towards the, into the moderate area, uh, they're buildings where you, you might have things falling off, you see. So you'll have some of those slight ones where might, might have a parapet or gable fall off or a chimney or in, you know, it doesn't have to fall out. They tend to fall out, but yeah, they can also fall into the building. Um, but uh, definitely once you're getting to moderate, you, you're looking at stuff that's actually fallen off the building, but the actual box of the building um, probably will be structure, have enough structural integrity. So you're not going to see, you know, problems with, with buildings falling over. Some, you, you've got a triaging exercise too. That's something to keep in mind too. When you've, you've had damage, uh, you won't know how severely damaged buildings are. So you're gonna to have to systematically go through and, and, and tag them as to whether the building can be used or just, entered briefly or not. Um, so some of these buildings, you know, might have end up with tags where you, you can't actually use the building until, you know, it's made safe or repaired yeah. in, in the moderate range, you know. Moderate is where you're, you're, you're getting up to a damage index of 0.5. So that, that reaches up to quite, quite severe damage, you know, at the tail end of it. Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions before we continue on with um, the program? Oh, so oh, yes. Thanks, Carl. Um, so um, we just looked at the consequences from the, I mean, the three selected uh, scenarios, but I mean, it would not give a full picture of the whole risk um, to the communities. And then as we said that there are large uncertainties and then those I mean, scenarios are, I mean, they're plausible, but they are not really definite I mean, events that we will see in the future. So we created, I mean, the long history of, I mean, like earthquake, I mean, the um, simulated ones um, the, as, as a catalog. And then we um, calculated, um, we do the, I mean, the same, um, computation job over the large event sets. And then we 
calculated the loss from the each event set and then used I mean that um, divided by the I mean the 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 period of time that we've looked at and then computed the average annual loss as a long-term risk measure. So the average annual loss of the whole um, Tasmanian state was estimated about like a 2.7 million Australian dollars, which is very minimal. And the ratio was estimated to be 0 0.01 um, per mille. It's not per percent, it's a, like a, a per thousand. So you can imagine that um, um, is I mean point zero zero one percent, and is I mean very low by I mean global standard, and also very relatively lower than the other regions such as the Perth with I mean point one per mile, and the uh, York in Western Australia has a point two, which is about like uh, twenty times I mean one magnitude higher than the uh, the um, uh, Tasmania. And then when you look at the um, average annual loss um, by the communities, then we see that the it is ranging uh, from 0 0.004 to 0 0.017. And then the largest one um, for Smithon, and then the smallest one is a uh, Margate. And the Hobart and Launceston um, is around like a 0 0.0. Uh, one uh, per mille. And these results are quite comparable to the, um, the value um, provide, uh, produced by the global earthquake, earthquake model. And then you can see left-hand side, um, the, they, um, the country risk I mean, profiles for Australia by developed by, I mean, global earthquake model. And the, the overall country, um, Australia is, I mean, estimated about, I mean, more or less like a 0 0.01 per mille uh, in terms of the average annual uh, average annual um, loss ratio. And um, we also uh, can um, construct the, I mean, the risk exceedance curve, which is very similar to the uh, hazard curve uh, that, I mean, Trev, I mean, they showed in the, um, uh, pro, pro, probabilistic, I mean, the size and hazard assessment. So which we can relate the uh, return period um, to the, I mean, the um, certain amount of loss uh, uh, from, from a I mean, event. And um, as I mentioned that, I mean, we can aggregate the average annual loss by the sp statistical area one. Um, and then the right-hand side picture shows that the uh, those figures, I mean, by the uh, for the Hobart by statistical area one, and then you can see that um, there are some um, varying um, ranges of I mean the values, but overall they are between like 0 0.01 to uh, 0 0.02 uh, values per mil um, in terms of I mean average annual loss ratio, and um, yeah, Launceston is about somewhat similar to Hobart, and then you could see that um, some area with uh, um, built, on, built upon the um, soft soil, um, it gets I mean, higher value than the other areas. And then some of the areas with uh, more vulnerable buildings are located. You can expect I a mean, little bit higher uh, values uh, from, from those I mean, vulnerabilities. And from the I mean, risk I mean, the excellence curve, we also can estimate how um, likely um, the consequence of the selected event uh, will be. So as I mean, we chose the, I mean, the scenarios, um, um, Trail mentioned that um, we considered, I mean, some hazard value at a, at a um, Hobart I mean, CBD uh, location. Um, and the return period can be estimated using the hazard curve. And then using the I mean, consequence of the, I mean, the, um, the selected events, we also can estimate the return period, which is quite comparable to each other. So, but I mean, it is a li little bit less than the actual, the return period I mean, used in the um, scenario event I mean, selection. 
that's it. And then I'm head to a mark. I wonder if I could just say just uh, one further thing about critical infrastructure. Um, for the uh, Lake Edgar earthquake, which is a much bigger earthquake, critical infrastructure, bridges and so on in proximity to that event would be much more damaged. You know? So I've really, comments were particularly looking at the concentration of critical infrastructure supporting uh, Hobart here. You know? So don't want to cause too much complacency. Okay, so what we'd like to now talk about is, uh, is resilience. <clears throat> so, so far we've been looking at uh, the consequences in terms of damage and, and cost of repair. Uh, but the other side of that is the, the ability of a community to cope, to recover, to have the means to do something about the risk they have and to adapt, supported by the institutions within the communities, the local government and so on. So in this project, what we've done is we've also introduced a measure of local scale community resilience. And we've made use of the Australian Natural Disaster Resilience Index um, developed by the University of New England under a project under the Bushfire Natural Hazards CRC. They've actually shortened the name for those of you familiar with it. They've got rid of the natural, it's called ADRI now, but we, we'll call it ANDRI, which is uh, how we've received it. But basically what it is, it's a measure of coping capacity. It's also a, a measure of adaptive capacity, the ability of a community to bounce and recover uh, after a major event. In this case, we're looking at an earthquake. So we're not looking at uh, how they, a community exhibits resilience after an event, but what we're saying, we're forecasting their resilience and it's a, it's a top-down approach. So um, whereas there are ways of assessing community resilience, working with the community, for example, the Torrens Institute developed a method, a town hall approach to, to build up a picture of community resilience. This is national scale, national metrics, giving a consistent lens, if you like, on resilience across the country. And we've applied that here to Tasmania. So basically they, they look at eight factors that they feel relate to our coping capacity, our, our ability to, to adapt, to change. Um, and then they roll those together into an overall uh, index. So they start off with about 70 indices that, that are available. Um, they come up with sub indices for each of these uh, individual measures. They then roll it up to a coping and adaptive capacity. And in the end, they end up with a uh, disaster resilience at the geography size of an SA2. So a population of about say 25,000 uh, people. It's a number between zero and one. If it's low, you have low resilience. If it's higher towards one, you have high resilience. So what does that look like? Well. Uh, again, looking at the scale, if, if your resilience is less than about 0.4, we would say your resilience is low. If your resilience uh, in terms of Andre is 0.7 or above, we'd say you've got uh, high resilience to uh, deal with a, a major natural disaster. And if we look at Tasmania, we've got the, the lens of Tasmania there. Of course, once you go into rural areas, the SA2s get very big. Uh, but then if we come down to Hobart there, yeah, you can see the some areas which are dark green. So Andrew would suggest that you've got quite a resilient local scale community there. Other areas are red uh, where they've got less capacity. And likewise, when you're looking at Launceston, smaller community, but um, you can see areas there where of high and low resilience. So what we've done in this project and there's mapping products for all 20 large communities, um, we've uh, started off with, with the financial risk and then we've combined it with the resilience in a traffic light approach. So even though the Andrew is a, is a number and we could be tempted to ma mathematically combine it in some way and researchers in, in Europe have done that, um, working with the University of New England, they would rather it not to attach so much importance to a number, but rather use it as a sort of a, a scoring. So we've used a, a traffic light approach and it's that little matrix that you see in the figure there that if you've got a high resilience, low risk, your dark green, on the other hand, if you've got low resilience and you've got a relatively high risk, we're saying you're red, and then there is a spectrum of colors between. So what you notice is the financial risk becomes a little bit more nuanced when you combine it with resilience. So if we take it down to community level, on the left there, you've got the uh, financial economic risk, if you like, associated with building damage for, for uh, Hobart. 
we combine it with Andrea, and you notice that the picture changes a little bit. You've got areas there that have become red, and that's because the local resilience is relatively low as a result, whereas some areas um, are consistently uh, green. <coughs> I've actually done something here for just a minute. I can't seem to get rid of uh, this. I'm trying to get, oh, I've got rid of it. I think I'm right. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep, right. Okay. And so if we look at uh, lawn systems, similar picture on the left there, uh, we've got the, um, uh, the financial risk and an interesting little swip. If, if you actually look at lawn system, notice that the the business district, CBD of, of Launceston is orange. And there are a lot of old unreinforced masonry buildings there that are no doubt contributing to it. If you go across the river uh, to Invermay, um, that's uh, a lighter orange. When we combine it with the resilience, they've actually changed. So what's happened is uh, Invermay is, is red uh, compared to the business district because of the uh, higher resilience, if you like, as measured by Andrew. And likewise, the area of Newstead Norswood down on the river there, that also has gone darker. And again, it's a reflection of the assessed level of resilience in the community. And a further example, that's Bernie Somerset, financial and then financial with resilience combined. So what does that do for our ranking? So as Huck has mentioned, um, Midway Point had the lowest financial risk on the left there. Uh, whereas uh, Smithton had the highest, we had the major centres of Devonport, Hobart, Launceston um, sitting in the middle of the range. So we've ranked them one to 10. But if we then combine uh, the average annualised loss with this resilience measure in a traffic wide approach, uh, the ranking does change. The, the, the lowest and the highest are the, are the same. But if you notice that the uh, more economic centres of Devonport and Hobart have migrated to a, a lower ranking of risk, whereas we've got communities uh, such as uh, Perth, and you've also got Georgetown, and you've got uh, uh, Dodges Ferry Lewisham, and they've migrated up, and it's a reflection of the assessment of their local scale resilience. So this could be quite useful in, if you're prioritizing uh, where you might want to concentrate efforts in, in helping a community become more resilient or address the more high-risk buildings. Um, this could actually be a better way of prioritizing it rather than just looking at economic measures alone. So what can we do about um, the vulnerability? Well, we can mitigate it. And this is research uh, that we've done in collaboration with the University of Adelaide, where if you're looking at a squat chimney, and there's a squat chimney in York, uh, what you see in the full colors of blue, red, green, and so on, are the fragilities or likelihood of damage um, uh, for the building, or for that component of the building as it is. Uh, but if we retrofit it, what happens is we, we reduce the likelihood that that component will be damaged. And uh, in a similar way, um, it, looking at, at a component level, uh, we've got a retrofit strategy. This is for a parapet. Again, we, we can actually model the shift in the vulnerability here of a parapet. Now, what that means for an overall building, and this is one of the, the uh, nine types of buildings, um, what you'll notice is that the fragility of the overall building drops through a retrofit. And this is a full level of retrofit of vulnerable elements. Um, and then what you notice then is that the actual likelihood of financial loss also reduced. So for this particular building type, uh, if you're looking at a peak ground acceleration of 0.4, um, the loss ratio on average halves uh, as a result of the retrofit measures. So let's actually look at an example. And this was the highest risk building that we considered in the nine, which was the uh, load bearing unreinforced masonry building with very big uh, openings at, at a shop front level. Um, we can restrain the parapets. Now that has a big bearing on people, you know, who are on the footpath who potentially could be, be killed by falling masonry, or uh, we can retrofit the whole box of the building and address the fact that we've got these big openings that are weakening the building when it's shaken in this direction. So what we find is that in terms of changing the overall, um, uh, if you like, acceleration that would cause a damage index of 0.5, really retrofitting the bits that fall off has, has less effect. But if we do the box, um, that has the greatest 
uh, effect on reducing the likelihood of overall damage to the building. However, um, it's the parapets that will have the greatest life safety uh, contribution, uh, whereas it's the, the box that's perhaps going to have the greatest influence on your insurance premium in, in reducing it. So there's two different ways of, of prioritising your retrofit. Ideally, you do both. And, uh, and what you do is you, you, you basically you're increasing the acceleration the building can take by about 75% or so. So these uh, vulnerability models, so for all those nine buildings, we've got multiple levels of retrofit and their effectiveness. What we've been able to do is then apply that in a virtual retrofit of the CBD and Hugh's gonna tell us about that. So this is a rather, I mean, brief, I mean, the um, um, summary of, I mean, what uh, we did. Um, so virtually we uh, applied, I mean, two different set of vulnerability functions. So we selected, I mean, only 35 buildings in the Hobart CBD and out of, I mean, the um, like a 20% of high risk building stock, mainly um, the URM buildings with um, uh, timber floors buildings in the Hobart CBD. And uh, based on the assumption um, of one building retrofitted over uh, the next time in 30 years time. So um, this is the, the rate of I mean, retrofit that we, uh, we used I mean, in other states, uh, state I mean, study as well. And um, we compare the average annual loss ratio for two SA1s where the retrofit uh, buildings are located, I mean, colored in um, red in the figure. And um, there were, I mean, marginal uh, reduction um, for the whole, I mean, the, um, the area. Um, but if you just um, the, compare the average annual loss of the selected buildings, then um, the reduction was quite um, the magnificent. So about like a 75 reduction uh, we can um, assess from the, I mean, the virtual retrofit exercise. And um, we also applied I mean, the, the virtual retrofit and then redo the, I mean, the calculation, um, the calculation of the consequences uh, from those the three scenario events. And then uh, we can see that there are more or less like a 10 to 20% of reduction in terms of the um, damage um, loss and also number of damage, uh, number of damaged buildings in those, I mean, the selected uh, the study areas from the scenario events. Let's see. So what you do actually see from the mitigation, because the risk is lower, you could argue, well, there isn't a strong case for doing mitigation. We can uh, perhaps give that a much lower priority. Because if you're basing on, a, on economic measures, that, that certainly is the case. Even if you include broader avoided economic losses, so it's not just avoided damage to bricks and mortar, uh, these buildings have business activity, so the damage associated with them will disrupt business activity. There's an economic loss associated with that. There's the cost of cleanup, getting rid of all the debris and stuff that's in the streets. That's cost to local government uh, and emergency services. Um, you've got um, uh, costs associated with medical care. So if, if you do actually have someone who's injured, they need to be cared. If you lose someone, uh, if you have a loss of life, you know, that's a very significant loss when you look at the statistical value of, of human life. However, um, what is interesting that even with the low levels of shaking that we see um, in Melbourne, uh, in, in Hobart, um, it can actually pick out the most vulnerable buildings in your community. And a, a classic case is the earthquake that Trevor referred to is the uh, Woods Point earthquake near Mansfield that caused damage in Melbourne. And this is an example of Chapel Street where the level of shaking was a little bit less than what we've simulated in, in Hobart. And yet, you know, the parapet fell off, you see. Fortunately, it was during COVID, so there weren't people on the street, um, but you could end up with an unacceptable outcome. So could the driver really be for mitigation, not, not to avoid loss due to damage, 
um, but rather address the issue with the risk to life, especially where you are in business, business precincts. And that's really been uh, one of the key drivers for prioritising retrofit in New Zealand. So they recently had a change to uh, their Building Act with the Earthquake Prone Buildings Amendment Act in 2016. And uh, it puts a high priority for retrofit, in fact, half the time to address high-risk buildings uh, where they are in, in high-risk pedestrian precincts with the potential for human life. And that also played out in uh, an initiative in Wellington that's been progressively retrofitting its high-risk buildings uh, in that they had the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake and there was considerable concern that the next event would be much closer to Wellington. There were many facades that could fall on business streets. And so they implemented the unreinforced masonry building program, went for about 18 months. It may, may still be going on at a, at a lesser level, but anyway, they got in as quickly as possible to retrofit what they hadn't got to. Um, the last time we spoke to Wellington City Council, they'd addressed about 120 buildings, you know, and just to tie back the facades, not economic reasons, just to prevent masonry falling into the street and killing people. And it's also interesting to note that if, if your objective is to stop stuff falling off that can kill people, the costs are considerably cheaper. So if we look at this type of building, if this type of building was in York, and this is pre-COVID inflation, so we've had uh, problems with building costs going up of late, uh, but to retrofit just the parapets, it would be about $24,000. Um, if it was a full retrofit of the building, it more like $104,000. So it's about a quarter of the cost just to tie back the things associated with risk to human life. And then finally, and especially you notice it walking around the Hobart CBD, and we had a nice walk around yesterday, um, is the heritage value of, of your building stock. So there can be other reasons why you might want to avoid irreparable damage to your heritage buildings. And so, and we're seeing that's increasingly a driver, certainly in some other jurisdictions, is putting a, a value on the sense of place you have as a result of your heritage building stock. So how do you go about retrofitting? Well, we've got some information we'd like to point you to that's uh, been developed again with a Western Australian driver, but equally applicable here to Tasmania. So uh, we've been looking at uh, the measures that can be used for different components, such as parapets, gables, uh, uh, chimneys, also uh, different levels of retrofit where you may be just tying, for example, a roof structure into an outside wall, or in conjunction with that, you're, not just, you're also going to stabilize the parapet above because it's tall enough to have an issue uh, with, with stability. Now, these details have been uh, developed and the overall body of work is, is being rolled into three communication products that may be of use here in Tasmania. The first one, uh, resisting the shake, it's, it's really targeting property owners as to the benefits of them dealing with a high-risk building and where they can go to to do it, you know. Um, the second one, earthquake retrofitting for resilient communities, <coughs> It's targeting policy, government, emergency management as to the broader benefits of retrofit. And that has to do with urban search and rescue logistics. It has to do with uh, avoided business disruption, the broader economic costs of uh, having a community that's not resilient um, to earthquake. And then finally, the one that's useful for practitioners, and I'm looking at one practitioner now, is the uh, earthquake retrofit for older masonry buildings. Um, and that has, is targeted to building design professionals and the construction industry on the how-to. And these sort of details have been provided uh, in, in that document. But it's worth noting that um, these older buildings can have problems with other hazards too. And uh, while we were working away over in WA, from, uh, Western Australia had a cyclone. You would have noticed that in the news. It was tropical cyclone Saroja. It did a lot of damage to uh, contemporary buildings but it also did a lot of damage to older heritage buildings <clears throat> in some of the inland towns in uh, Western Australia. Highlighting that if you're going to go in there and retrofit for one thing, why don't you fix all the deficiencies? Why don't you fix the deficiency, say for wind at the same time? Because the cost of gaining access is quite significant. The incremental cost of dealing with other deficiencies is relatively small. So what we're presently working on is uh, this document, Severe Wind Retrofit for Older Masonry 
buildings and it's a similar document but looking at the additional measures to deal with uh, the type of deficiencies for wind that these uh, buildings have. So just as to timing, the previous three documents uh, there in review, we would expect them to be available in the next month or so. Um, so we've got an industry reference group that's been, has just uh, recently reviewed them. Um, and so we're close to finalizing it. This document we hope to uh, basically complete at the same time. And through Carl, we'll be able to point you to, to these documents once they're, they're discoverable. The reason why they're so applicable is that these buildings are your buildings too. You know, the, the way we built back in, from the UK the architecture and construction methods um, are, are just the same. And quite frankly, if you go across to New Zealand, buildings are the same. They're built, the older ones are built the same way with the same uh, typical vulnerabilities. And just a final note on this uh, more resilience focused approach to um, uh, our more vulnerable older buildings. Here is an example which was uh, done in the town of York. It used to be the uh, house of the convict depot superintendent and then became the home of the magistrate. Um, it's now the, the, a museum in the, in the Shire. Uh, but anyway, that building was retrofitted initially with a, a focus on earthquake, but they also retrofitted it for wind as well. And also they made that building more resilient for bushfire because it's in a peri-urban area. So, um, an overall resilience building approach to a building uh, rather than just having in mind uh, one particular peril or hazard. So let me uh, share what we think are the highlights of, of this project uh, that we've been able to do in collaboration here with the Tasmanian government. Um, for us, it's been our first Australian statewide uh, assessment of surface earthquake hazards. So we've always had the bedrock hazard or had a, a good definition of the bedrock hazard, we've been able to bring that to the surface and, and look at the, uh, the, the contribution of overlying soils to, to local hazard. It's also been for us the first Australian statewide assessment for earthquake uh, risk, uh, which enables then uh, comparisons between communities, uh, direct comparisons uh, communities across the state, uh, we've been able to develop the scenarios, uh, three of those, which we hope will be, be helpful for emergency management planning. Because earthquakes don't happen so often, sometimes it's hard to understand what you'd have to deal with. Well, scenario uh, modeling gives you an idea of, of the things that you might have to deal with and how you would plan for it. Uh, we've been able to combine uh, resilience with damage severity to give a more holistic view. And again, when it comes to those 20 communities, maybe to prioritize them in a different way when it comes to their needs. And also, uh, I think it's quite useful that we've been able to point one jurisdiction to the work in another uh, as to work that could be useful when it comes to uh, mitigating uh, high-risk buildings here in Tasmania. So just summarizing uh, the essence of what we've talked about today. Uh, first of all, um, yes, we've ignored earthquake hazard. Uh, this has resulted in vulnerable buildings in our communities. As you will have seen, unreinforced masonry does represent perhaps the greatest risk that you have here in uh, Tasmania. What we've been able to do is uh, to confirm really the uh, conclusions of your state national disaster risk assessment for earthquake in that the earthquake risk in, in Tasmania is relatively low uh, compared to some other jurisdictions, for, for example, compared to uh, Western Australia. Uh, we found that both of your major cities, Launceston and Hobart, uh, have similar uh, risk to earthquake. And also we've been able to show at a local scale where that risk varies due to the, play, uh, the contributions of overlying uh, regolith or soil. We've also been able to highlight parts of communities that have a high risk because of resilience. So that can be quite insightful in understanding where, where communities have less ability to bounce so, uh, you know, how can they be made more resilient? One is, one is what you do with the bricks and mortar. Uh, the other one is how you improve resilience within your community to cope uh, with, with future disasters. What we hope we've highlighted too is the uncertainty in the work. We, we think we've, there's quite a considered piece of work that will be of use to the Tasmanian government, but there's still uncertainty when it comes to our predictions. So we could be surprised, you know, by what, what actually happened in a future earthquake. Uh, life safety and heritage preservation uh, are probably the key considerations beyond economic when it comes to mitigating here. And, and then finally, the information that 
we've been able to develop through other initiatives in, in collaboration with the University of Adelaide um, may be useful for Tasmanian communities. So we'd be interested in your feedback on, on those products, you know, once they're made discoverable to you. Thank you. I'll hand back to Carl to field the questions. Mm. The resources that Mark um, spoke about, as soon as they're released, we're um, planning on putting the link on the mineral resources webpage um, under the Natural Hazards Earthquake location. Is that right, Claire? It's um, and so that will take you to those resources as soon as they're um, published and available and the guidelines there, um, as will be um, the recording of this um, presentation today. So in regards to the recording, it was actually this microphone up here. So we're catching the, the presentations, the presenters um, information. So that'll be there. So if you've got colleagues that were unable to make it um, today to hear this information, also will be the full detailed published report, which will have the, the outcomes for each of the 20 municipalities on there and the detailed mapping and modelling that we just saw the snapshot here today. So that's um, is that about a month, month off as well, isn't it, Mark? Yep. So again, um, following on from our discussions here, um, some more questions and answers to here to while we've actually got our um, experts in the room to um, to um, ask questions. Matt. Uh, yeah, just to close the programs that were done in WA about who was the characters and so forth. You know how they were, were they funded specifically by the by the government there or were they co contributions? Do you have an understanding about how they the process they went through assessing which buildings and, and funding arrangements for them. So, um, so in terms of the communication products, uh, they were funded by cost sharing between Geoscience Australia and the Western Australian Government, largely. You know, that, that's basically how it's been done. In, in terms of um, prioritising how to do your retrofit um, or what you might retrofit, that's a good question because we're actually working with the Shire of York at the moment. I don't know if you've been to, to York in WA. So WA is oldest inland town beautifully pre uh, preserved uh, heritage precinct. You can understand why they're very uh, concerned about losing it in an earthquake. It did have a major impact. So the, the Shire has asked to take what we've learned from the research and come up with a forward strategy of, of how they would progressively deal with the most uh, vulnerable and, and those that rep represent the greatest risk uh, to, to their, their community. So that's what we're working on at the moment. And the main approach is, this is how we're approaching it. We're saying, well, this is the vulnerability of the building, but this is the consequence to people if, if that building failed. And uh, York is interesting because four times a year, they actually close the main street. They host festivals, for example, the annual motorcycle festival, and it literally has thousands of people in a, in a narrow main street. Um, and so if an earthquake occurred, we, we actually modeled a Meckering style earthquake hitting York and 500 people would die. You know, that, that would be, and that'll also depend on fire and rescue is how well I'm looking at uh, fire and rescue now in that you'll probably have other people that would succumb to their injuries be, given the enormity of the event in a, in a more remote town. So, um, so that's what we're working through is, is giving them a, an idea because when it comes to retrofit, it's a multi-decadal journey. Uh, which you start and then eventually you finish. And Wellington City, for example, is getting towards the end of theirs. There are a lot of local governments in New Zealand that haven't done very much at all. And now with the change to the legislation, uh, they're having to and they're starting their journey. So I guess from an Australian perspective or a Tasmanian perspective is working out where your priorities are and then a, a, a strategy where you'll address those of highest risk of, uh, to people, really, in, in terms of uh, failure in an earthquake. Those programs that have already been made, for example, where they are going to, you know, they will get the loan. Were the building owners responsible or required to, to co-fund or to pay that, or were yeah. there direct? How, how was that implemented? I suppose. Right. So, so, so if you go to WA, 
closer to home. Um, uh, they, they have a heritage council and a grants program that's managed by the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage. Um, and they can fund up to a 50% cost share to a project of up to 200,000. And so it means the property owner's up for, for half, um, but that can take, take the edge off. And when we're looking at the level of retrofit of those scale of buildings, apart from the town hall, which is millions, and they, they're concerned about their town hall, um, 200,000 would largely do it, you know, a major project. And you, you do other heritage preservation works as all, or, or, or part of it, yeah. Um, if you go to Wellington, uh, Wellington's perhaps the most proactive council in New Zealand, and, and they've got a, a range of ways of trying to incentivize it. And it comes that their incentivization comes from giving you rebates on your tax on your land tax, so your rates. And they also have a grants program that helps you engage uh, design professionals to work out what can be done and what the cost would be. So that'll help you make that commitment. And the last time we spoke to Wellington City, um, they were also uh, looking at being guarantor to financial institutions where there was not enough equity in the building for the property owner to take action with, with a financial institution. So they would go guarantor for the loan, recognizing that once the retrofit work was completed, the building will be of greater value, especially in New Zealand where they are recognizing the value of having a building that's more resilient. So, um, so I, I understand in, Tas in Tasmania, um, you don't actually have a heritage grants program um, for this sort of work. That's, that's my understanding. But most jurisdictions do. And interestingly, the, um, the documents, even though it's tended to have a WA focus, we've actually provided uh, links to state level programs that could help you know, get um, you know, the project across the line. And one of the, from what you were saying there, your key buildings of risk were yeah. your your churches, or what was it? What were the ones where you've got the greatest safety of life from those yeah. bits failing? Well, 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 they're all pretty bad. Okay, <laughs> if if you put them in in a in a business precinct, anything with a parapet that can fall or a gable, um, that that's a high risk building. What we did find, as just responding to your question, Carl, uh, we found that the the taller um, load bearing unreinforced masonry buildings, and there's many examples here. Uh, in, in Hobart uh, have a higher vulnerability. Uh, and, and that's also associated with the fact that the structure below is supporting multiple floors and often they've opened up, you know, the street frontage for commercial purposes. So it's weakened the building, you know, on the street front. And there's ways of addressing it. It's, it's just a case of uh, spending the money to do it. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Do you want to go and, I mean, Sam, do you want to go and see if um, we can actually get lunch brought um, forward? We're actually doing, yeah. we're doing too well. So the note for tomorrow, we can. <laughs> <laughs> so as a workshop, um, from the people in the room here, have you gained some benefit from this today? Yes. Yeah. So what's probably you're very positive there. So what? <laughs> so I'm going to put you on the spot and say, what is your take home? I don't have a bit more of an understanding of how earthquakes happen and the consequences that they have, which I've previously done. Yep. Um, the other non-reinforced buildings that didn't even cross my mind. But yeah, the effects on infrastructure as well, yeah, quite interesting. Yeah, and I think the key linkage when you to throw in storms, because we've actually had some buildings here in Hobart, which have, I think, resulted in some injuries, such as the old fragment building, where you actually had the, the parapets blow off the front in a storm. So that's that double, double safety of life factor as well. Um, anyone else sort of got some key learnings that you want to share today that you think might go back and change where you have some influence? One thing that is interesting is that uh, a lot of the time with these discussions is might be based on previous experience, but there's not necessarily a lot of maths or research behind it. Uh, there's, there's 
experience in learning, but I think it's interesting because, because it's such a less likely event uh, having to extrapolate some of the things to, to say what's the risk and what it will about. I think it's interesting to go back and look at the statistics and look at some numbers and things like that in order to inform Now, I'm going to ask this question quite slowly to give the guys a um, chance to um, think about that. So, between Matt, Robin, and Mark, um, what do you get? What did you get from today that might actually help you look at your um, emergency response planning for the case of um, an emergency here in Tasmania? So, you've got you know, the fire service, you're going to be looking at like that search and rescue, dealing with the people that have. And parapets fall on them or trapped in cars. Robin representing CPFEM or police here, you're looking at the broader coordination things mapped from an emergency planning perspective. Um, what did you, what benefit have you gained from today that you think might, you know, help guide some of the decisions going forward from today? Well, certainly from my perspective, I think the my concern is we've got a number of small towns that have quite old buildings with and parapets are and that to me to come across as one of the biggest things. And whilst the, the actual risk of earthquakes collapse and whole buildings is quite low, the fact that we do get a, a bit of a shake just exposes us to to me the, the risk of parapets coming out. So for me, and I've got um, um, some council representation here today, but for me I think that we probably need to I was going to be looking to promote this presentation out amongst the REMCs because so I think there's a number of councils who might need to, to reassess where their, their risks are within their particular towns. Uh, and that example you gave of uh, your having um, community events in and amongst those old buildings to me sort of highlights a risk that we probably haven't necessarily considered. Well, we certainly didn't consider as part of the, the risk assessment we did last year. So I think for me, the focus. From this drives an investment in mitigation of those old buildings and the work that, that can be done there. Um, because whilst it, um, this has been driven by the, the assessment of an earthquake risk, there are others that then have significant wind, wind events that would cause, as you said, an SES now to respond uh, to collapsed buildings or, sorry, certainly collapsed uh, uh, parts of buildings. And uh, obviously, we want to mitigate that down again. I think it's trying to focus the effort of building owners and local government into addressing those risks that we've got. There are middle through Carrick, Longford, um, all those you know, lovely little picturesque towns in uh, particularly northern northern Tasmania, which have got a lot of older infrastructure to focus to the uh structure plates are something we claim fairly early in our career for, and then there are additional it's confident of course to do further so it's a really a core part of most priorities the four priorities uh bonds in terms of looking at the marine force base because that's a I suppose it's a big tick in terms of when they've got fire and you don't have the same problem with instability. Absolutely so a lot of things this for SARS as well when they're tied back in the building it's probably push steel beams when the steel beams pick up well six K and they're pushing the SARS out so that's probably a major um issue that we might have to get down some years ago. So the actual facade was some um, 1.3 million out of the community. So that was a chance to go across the movement. So just to reinforce, yeah, the underground formation is one of the biggest killers. Um, in terms of the, the chance of that coming in, is quite huge. Um, it's definitely one we try and manage scenes for. So we also utilize all the screen posts and we also be assessed in front of the cars as well. So um, it is something that we're really, really aware of. Um, not just the burn, but also for natural disasters and wind effects as well. So, um, yeah, it's been a good um, consolidation of information. So, and again, one of the things where you saw about the numbers of, uh, what was the number of moderate phases? That was about the level of the parapet collapse, wasn't it? We uh, definitely had a parapet down at the <laughs> yeah, So, what was that sort of numbers for those scenarios around 50s, was it? Yeah. It's been a so if we don't do that at lunchtime in the middle of the CBD or things like that, you know, there's the chance of someone going out. 
So, Mark, with the you know the, the resources of your emergency services, you know, is that sort of looking at possibility of having you know sixty um, parapet collapses in public spaces as a coordination? As soon as any fire crews in uh, that area, um, the rest of the resources very much have to um, in terms of our ability to respond. Um, obviously, we probably utilise the SES um, as well. But in terms of the only two global incidents that language we could be more to be short, but there are other other urban centers in Australia. So the good work relationship with Victoria, New South Wales, and South Australia. Those are areas of room to administrate the Australia to respond to those other incidents that we have seen. Yeah, so it's not just the Victoria and South Australia, it's all the other areas of the country. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. 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 With our arrangements now, we basically need to go stand by for a 24 hour period. So, for the purposes, we have to do structure collapse. But if you're talking about 60 structure collapse in the same time, we are going to be relatively count wanting. Um, and I guess the reassuring thing is these aren't complex civil search and rescue things. It's no. people under a few bricks opposed Absolutely. to a whole building project. So, that must be a reassuring thing for you. Absolutely. Um, and it would be great for the business. You know, obviously, we're always trying to look at more financial and increase our workforce in terms of trying to um, take these instances to its own areas. When we think about the pure way that small facades or, or a power of a wall, it's you've really got a favorable chance of survival because it's only more than one or another one. Look at the square metre root of tiles is 100 kilos. So I'm not sure many of us can just stand out in the head for me this way. Um, and it's got the weight to disappear. Oh, I'm just thinking in terms of evacuation and access and egress routes and things you generally think about fire and flood and things and maybe something like an earthquake would make that uh, um, maybe a city block or something like that is suddenly not particularly. The Davies Street, the Quarry Street, yeah. Collins Street, Liverpool Street, yeah, it is a strange <laughs> drive through or to set up some yeah. sort of forward command post or some recovery centre or something. So just some of those. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
yeah. from a logical point of view. Um, yeah, so from a seismic perspective, we do know that the radiation pattern of the ground shaking energy does vary depending on the orientation of the fault. Um, those of you with a keen eye, when I showed the intensity from the, the Woods Point earthquake, so the Victorian earthquake from last year, you would have noticed that there's higher strong ground shaking in the north south direction, that east west, and we think that's due to the predominantly north south. Um, so that was an odd earthquake in that it was a strike slip, so a horizontal <laughs> rupture from, from that earthquake where the energy would have uh, gone in the, the north and south directions, um, and less so in towards Melbourne, which I guess is a, a good thing. But, um, as a consequence, we did see higher, well, higher than expected levels of, of minor damage um, at, at large distances away from that earthquake in uh, regional towns. And predominantly to I'm reinforcements for churches. It's <laughs> falling off. <laughs> uh, actually, there's one thing I wanted to add while I had the mic um, was the issue of earthquake triggered landslides as well, which is perhaps something that we hadn't noticed. And, and looking around the town, there's some, some quite large hills around. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a potential for rock falls or, or landslides that would pose a, a secondary hazard um, as well. So, uh, I guess the, the Christchurch earthquakes were a, a good uh, example of that where there were some rock falls and, and landslides associated with that that did um, additional damage to buildings. Okay, so I, so thank you for your presenting again. So if my probably take home message from this is that um, you know we are actually we do have the risk of earthquake here in Tasmania, but the actual threat to life generally is actually fairly low compared to some of our, our mainland states. But we do actually have some area issues of spots of high risk, and that's mainly from what we've found today is, especially with our heritage building stops, bits falling off or bits falling in, uh, which are going to cause probably widespread but localised issues to deal with. It was actually quite reassuring to hear from your magnitude events that you're likely to see at most of our critical infrastructure, the in ground or on ground is probably going to be um, reasonably okay unless it happens to be the um, um, substation that's in the 1920s um, heritage listed um, building that falls on the transformer. Um, you know, those things there. But, um, but again, you know, so it's looking at, you know, we're going to see, you know, some deaths, we're going to see some minor injuries, but we're not looking like seeing a wholesale um, structural collapse. Yeah. Um, so that you know that's our planning thing. So looking at things like I guess our strategies there is you know looking at how do we go for food and build mutual aid and those sort of things. Um, and that these are actually some fairly simple mitigation measures that have been well designed and well planned for that we can actually make with a seventy five percent reduction in the risk by yeah. um, by you know. Things such as reinforcing our parapets or reinforcing our chimneys. Um, and that things are actually, if we face a more uncertain event with more stronger storm events and those other things, and as buildings age, I guess those structures become weakened, um, have other benefits as well. So thank you for sharing those um, insights. Um, thank you, everyone, for having this opportunity to come here today as a part of State Grove's ongoing strategies of trying to share information on our um, natural hazards, especially those of a geological nature. And it's been a program we've been doing for a number of years. And those that want to hear more about um, tsunamis and have got questions like that, I'm sure Claire and her colleagues or Nick weren't talking about landslides will be happy to share some of that information over lunch, which we've got a bit longer. But you're welcome here to stop and mingle in this room, enjoy some lunch until one o'clock. So thank you everyone for um, for coming.
And if you want um, some certificates, um, be building practitioners or those that want CPD points, you please um, go out and register out the front. And if you want a certificate of attendance, please put your name in there as well, and we'll organise one to be emailed to you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> 